30 years ago, Judy Chicago's installation, The Dinner Party, challenged the art world and changed the history of feminist art. The giant tri- triangular dinner table, nearly 50 feet long, with 39 place settings, paid tribute to historic women in ceramic, porcelain, and textile, honoring the likes of Emily Dickinson, Ishtar of Mesopotamia, Sojourner Truth, and Emily Carr. Judy Chicago literally sought to create a place at the table for women. She represented female genitalia in her tributes, creating what some have dubbed full frontal feminism, a practice she continues today. Despite the fact that male artists have been creating female nudes for centuries, the work was considered controversial when the dinner party first toured Canada in the early 80s. Museums and galleries had had to extend their hours. Attendance records were broken everywhere it showed. Judy Chicago has gone on to a prolific art career since, producing monumental and sometimes collaborative works such as The Birth Project and Resolutions for the Millennium, Challenging Norms and the Rarified Art World. Judy Chicago is here this week with an exhibition at the Textile Museum of Canada. It surveys her textile work and her influence on women artists who followed in her footsteps. And right now, Judy Chicago is with me live in Studio Q. Hello. Hi. Great pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. I read a quote from you that said, from early on, age five or so, I set my sights on becoming the kind of artist who would make a contribution to art history. Is that accurate? That's accurate. What did you, at the age of five or so, conceive of how you would change art history? Well, I started drawing when I was three, and I started going to the Art Institute in Chicago when I was five. And um, how I happened to set my sights that way is hard to remember, but I know I did. And in fact, when I was 17, I do remember this, before I went to California to college, I was out in the sand dunes in Indiana where my family f- had friends who had cottages and we used to go there because my parents were, my family was very impoverished. We had very little money, so mm. we used to bo- borrow their cottages or go to their cottages. And so there were all these kids, we were on the beach and I said at that time, I have a destiny. And I, I just knew it all my life. To I the mean, other kids or yeah, to yourself? Yeah, to the other kids. And what did they say? They <laughs> thought I was crazy, of course. But, <laughs> right. but you know, I, I just knew that I, you know, I was leaving sh- Chicago and my family. I was going to California to start um, my career, start studying at UCLA. And I just knew that I had a path that I had to follow. You see, it's interesting. I mean, once you gain a, a political consciousness or uh, through the teens and into the university years, it's understandable to think that somebody has that kind of path. At that early age, where did you get your ambition from? Well, first of all, I never wanted to do anything but be an artist from the time I was really little. Uh-huh. I was the school artist. And even then, I would go, my mother used to talk about this, you know, I was perfectly happy going into my room and drawing. I was perfectly happy. Hmm. And it was sort of like my art life, even early on, was more real to me than my real life. You know, there's an art historian named Gail Levin who wrote uh, biogra- my biography called Becoming Judy Chicago. And she interviewed 250 people, and she used to write me these emails and say, do you remember so-and-so? Do you remember so-and-so? <laughs> this person remembers you went here, you went there, blah, blah, blah. Right. I'm like... No, I don't remember them. I don't remember doing that, but I can tell you what work I was making at that time. Do you, did you ever uh, question it? Did you ever think, well, I'm not like the other kids. i, I, I got to go play baseball or something. No, I, was I never like, was interested in baseball. I grew up in the generation where girls, you know, all you wanted to do was get out of gym. I mean, it wasn't okay. until I started working out in my 30s that I realized I was really coordinated and probably could have been a gymnast. But when I was little, you know, gym was associated with wearing these horrible green <laughs> gym clothes. Right, right. <laughs> I see. So you weren't up for the fashion statement. And so you stayed in the room making art. Who were your early role models as an artist? Were, were there women you looked at? Well, to? no. See, that was, I think, one of the problems is that when I was little and used to roam through the galleries of the Art Institute thinking about Toulouse-Lautrec and Monet and, you know, because there were these beautiful haystacks in the Art Institute, I didn't notice that all the men 
I mean, all the artists were, were men. men. I just didn't notice that. I mean, maybe there was a cassette. And in fact, that was really what happened to me after 10 years of professional practice. I started looking to see if there had been any women before me who encountered the same kind of obstacles I encountered in graduate school and then in my first decade of professional practice. And that's how I uncovered women's history. For many viewers, I, I, I talked about it in the introduction. It was your 1970s installation, as you know, the dinner party that changed the way they thought about women and art. Were you out to accomplish that? So is something that revolutionary, or were you just making the art that was coming out of you? I, I don't think I realized quite how radical or controversial the dinner party was was going to be. In fact, I, I remember when it first premiered at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art in 1979, and, you know, there were lines of people, and people were putting flowers on me and telling me the work changed their life. And, you know, it was like, oh, my God, this is great. And Susan Stamberg from NPR interviewed me, and I was telling her, you know, oh, what I discovered is I was a really naive young woman. You know, what I discovered is that women can be themselves. It's really, you know, it's a new period. And she said, Judy, what are you going to do when the controversy starts? And I go, controversy? What controversy? <laughs> so I set out to do t certain things. I set out to teach women's history to a broad and diverse audience. I set out to test the art world to see if a woman artist working at the same level of ambition that men had worked historically would be supported mm -hmm. and received. And I mean, those were my two goals. And I, I certainly achieved the first one in the sense that, you know, the dinner party was propelled around the world mm -hmm. by this grassroots tour, which also moved it around Canada and, you know, to a viewing audience of over a million people. Mm -hmm. and, but the second one that is unfortunately did teach me that, no, a woman artist working at that same level was not going to have an easy time. Well, what, what were you naive about? Because you, that, you, you, said, was, you, you said that you were naive about women uh, um, being able to be themselves and not to deny the history of patriarchy, but weren't you an example of a woman being yourself? Yeah, and I got a lot. I mean, I encountered a tremendous amount of resistance. I mean, anybody who's familiar with my career knows that the dinner party, and it was very confusing for a lot of years because ostensibly the dinner party was a huge success. I lost everything. I lost everything. I lost my studio, my staff, my marriage. I was in debt. I had no way of, like, I had no opportunities. Wow. You know, for example, here in Canada, okay, the dinner party was in Calgary, in Toronto, and in Montreal, right? It broke records. Between the time in the 80s that the dinner party was here and the time I came back, to, for a glass show last year, I had had one offer for a commercial gallery show. One. I showed at the Dennis O'Connor Gallery. Why? Because one. you're considered too controversial. I have no idea why, but that is completely contrary to what is normally a career trajectory. Right. When you have a big museum show, you're usually swamped with offers, opportunities. I had, it was the complete opposite. And so it was really confusing because here's all these people seeing me as a success, and I basically had to start all over again. What about the attention the work got? Uh, some of the attention was focused on the genocide imagery. Well, but even that was a distortion of the dinner party. That's what I, I wanted to ask you about. Well, I mean, the dinner party deals with female agency. You know, their images, the plates are images of female agency as they rise up and attempt to get off the plates. But the plates are only one aspect of the dinner party. The plates are in a large context. It literally took 20 years for the New York Times to stop referring to the dinner party as genitalia on plates and finally start talking about a history of women in Western civilization. And, you know, I used to but say... But you're aware, but you were, you are aware that it was a provocative uh, uh, no, installation. No, I didn't see any reason that female agency or female sexual mm. agency should be any more provocative than the images we see by male artists all the time. You know, phallic images. It's just that it's a completely... It, was now I understand in retrospect that it was a new iconography. And so right. people were shocked and they didn't know how to read it. They didn't know how to 
read it in a transformed way. It took a really long time. It took over two decades. Let's draw the line from, from then to now. You, If you were issuing a critique of the way women's history had been neglected, which you were, but also of the male-dominated art world, how far have we come since you began your art career? Well, there have been significant changes uh, in the sense that there are many more women and artists of color showing and there's greater diversity, which is to be celebrated, but by and large, it's at entry level. So, for example, in major exhibitions, museum exhibitions, the Tate Modern, between 2000 and 2005, only 2% 2 of the solo shows were women. And when the Guerrilla Girls surveyed Washington museums, including the National Gallery, which is a taxpayer-funded museum, 99% of the work in their collection is male and 97% is white. And more to the point, recently there's been a study of women artists and the, our earnings in, in the states. And young women artists make 90 cents on a dollar for every dollar made by their male peers. The older you get, the less you earn mm. until women of my generation make 62 cents. Now, again, this is completely contrary to the American dream, which is you work hard, you make a success, and you're rewarded. And that is simply not true. And still the problem of erasure that the dinner party recounts and chronicles is a story that is continuing in terms of what happens to women artists after they die. It's, it's a lot of, I've got a lot to respond to what, what you've said. <laughs> Let me try to take this. Um, you know, I'm trying to get a, se a sense of, I mean, it sounds like you're, uh, you, you obviously point a, a portrait of, of things not being entirely rosy for women artists still. At the same time, there's elements of what you're saying that suggest progress. Yeah, that's, uh, both are true. Images... Let me, let me get back to the female genitalia for a minute. If they, because they that those images continue to be a theme in your work. Is this post vagina monologues world? Uh, in that world, has the imagery taken on a different kind of social or political meaning for you now? Well, first of all, my work has evolved, which is one of the goals of this week. Natalie Naj, the director of the textile, Canadian Textile Museum, where there's a major survey of my work in the needle and textile arts, wanted a picture of my, a large, for Canadians to have a larger picture of my work. So there are actually three exhibitions opening this week, one at the Canadian Textile Museum on Wednesday night, then on Friday night I'm having an exhibition with my husband, photographer Donald Woodman, at the O'Connor Gallery, and that will that includes work related, prints and drawings related to the textile museum show. And then on Saturday from uh, 2 to 4, there's a show opening at Rouge Concept, a new gallery, and that is a survey show curated by uh, Virginia Eichhorn, the curator of the Canadian okay. Textile Museum. And Christian Bernard Singer, the owner of the gallery, was telling me that people have already been coming in, and they're just astounded to see the range of my work. Okay, the, but uh, so ha And so my question, work has uh, evolved uh, yeah. in the sense that, yes, my work focused on images of female experience in the 70s and 80s with the um, dinner party and the birth project, but then I began to get interested in, for example, the construct of masculinity. I got interested in the subject of the Holocaust with my husband, and as I my interests changed and grew, I began to see women's experience in a larger context, global context of injustice and oppression, which is what has interested me in the last 10 to 15 years, and then I started working in glass, which gives me a way to see through appearances. Literally. Literally, uh, the right. The dinner party, uh, obviously a central work of a feminist heart, of art, now has a permanent home mm -hmm. at the Brooklyn Museum. This is as of two years ago. Is this the rebel becoming the establishment? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I would say... I mean, you got a permanent installation. Well, what else do you need? Well, that was my goal. I mean, my goal from the beginning was um, 
that the dinner party be permanently housed because I felt that was the only way it would overcome the erasure it recounts. Although I have continued, un unlike most artists, I've continued to be involved with the dinner party, and we're about to launch a K-12 through dinner party curriculum, which will be a free downloadable series of PDF files so that young children, future generations, will learn women's history as part of their education mm. as opposed to having to have compensatory education to learn women's history. Your show at the Textile Museum also includes the work of other artists, women you've influenced. What gives you more satisfaction, Judy Chicago, to have uh, created your own body of work or encouraged other women to make art? Well, that's a complicated question. Obviously, I'm an artist. It's not that so, complicated. Yeah, it question. is, because obviously I'm an artist, and my own work is central to my focus, my career, my life, you know, my interests. At the same time, I'm very happy if I've opened the way for other women artists, younger women artists. I'm very, very happy about that because certainly I would I was very grateful for the path that opened up to me, not because directly of women artists before me, because I didn't know about them. But once I discovered them, then th what they had done provided a way for me to see myself, affirm myself, my own impulses. Like I can still remember seeing Emily Carr at the Vancouver Art Gallery in 1972, which was a complete revelation because she was mm. totally unknown in America. And I looked at the way in which she had anthropomorphized the forest and looked into the center of the forest. And it just gave me a lot of courage to be able to pursue my own vision of the world, which also was from the center. It's nice to have you here. Thanks for coming back to Canada. Thank you. I'm enjoying being here. Judy Chicago's latest textile exhibition is called When Women Rule the World. For more information on her work, go to judychicago.com. And she joined me here in Studio Q.